Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome back to NPTEL the national program on technology enhanced learning this program is an initiative by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. As you are aware, our domain is cultural studies and we have already completed three modules in our deliberations on various uh, concepts, theories, okay, formulations, sites of cultural studies. I welcome you to module 4 which uh, we may entitle cultural industries, cultural forms okay? and it is this, this module is uh, slightly um, you know um, of a more uh, miscellaneous nature really to be honest uh, compared when compared to the other modules uh, in the sense that the last two lectures of these modules would be uh, devoted to you know um, sort of a winding up uh, or, you know of all that we have discussed so far I would also you know like to add um, uh, some sort of a review or um, you know a critical assessment of what we have done in these virtual classes pointing out to some of you know um, the points regarding the limitations of cultural studies you know as a methodology that have been pointed to out and we cannot you know um, afford not to look at these if even as we try to better our discipline. Also part of uh, you know this module will comprise a couple of lectures on virtuality on virtual culture since uh, this is one area uh, we are already beginning to inhabit even if we are in some of us are in the third world countries. Okay? Uh, the first part, you know, few lectures would be devoted to cultural industry. Uh, cultural forms like media, uh, form like commodity for instance television right. Okay, so well let us um, move ahead and do a recap of what we have done so far as far as the last module and the last lecture are concerned. Well you will remember that module 3 was devoted to sites, sites of cultural studies in which we saw that we could call you know um, aspects of cultural study um, like body, space, time, ethnicity, development, globalization, biology, etc. We could term the, these sites in the sense that these are concepts all right I agree but importantly these are also sites or locations okay, where, um, where culture happens where we see the working out of culture we see how we may describe uh, culture build discourses around these topics right um, by borrowing concepts that we did we looked at in the previous module that is a model bef module before uh, the third module which was entitled key concepts right. So well let us for instance we found uh, that when we consider time okay, as a site of cultural studies we find that um, there is a movement away from the traditional concepts of time as teleological or having a, an end a designed end or designated end. We also saw that time in the traditional framework was considered evolutionary in nature and there was a linearity time as an arrow okay. it was considered in a linear sort of fashion right it was an, uh, we could say quite an unproblematized way of looking at time. Then we found particularly through Michel Foucault and his genealogical approach that time indeed may also be seen as something that is non teleological which where events do not move on in a march to a designated telos or end. We also saw through Foucault that history may be considered not in a linear neat linear narrative but as entangled events deviations um, haphazard call it a haphazard history and where there is also room for errors and reappraisals. Okay? So um, this is uh, you know, these are two 
um, points we saw as far as time as site is concerned. Then we looked at uh, space, right? Space was also a site for us, and we found that uh, space is really uh, not just just a physical given, not just topography. Okay, space is also a social construction. In that space has to do with work, family, leisure, consumption, privacy, and all these are matters of culture or ways of living, right? Space is therefore cultural. This is what we saw, and space is therefore according to us a site in which we see the workings of culture, right? Uh, the last lecture was devoted to biology as a site, and even though we did take up the biological approach in uh, module 1 in I think lectures uh, 3, uh, 4 and 5, where we looked at things like evolutionary psychology, the you know um, the, the origins of the modern mind and evolution and culture etcetera. We are also bringing in biology here and part of course of some of the things you know the discussed in those lectures uh, plus the biosemiotic um, aspect of the cultural studies analysis of um, biology. Okay? So, we saw that the main debate in biology is that between nature and nurture or nature and culture and we saw that it is better to adopt a methodological holism where studying biology okay, uh, and bringing in the biological element or aspect to culture into cultural studies uh, should be a non-reductionist one that is everything should not be reduced uh, to biology and we should look at organisms as complex systems where they interact with uh, you know um, one another and there is a systemic context okay that is the system has a context and also make room for things like uh, over determination to agree that phenomena or uh, you know events even if they are biological events are also like physical events over determined that is there the theory of over determination where we hold that things or uh, events have more causes than can be or than are okay, um, identified by us by our science and technology. Then we saw that biosemiotics that biology can also be considered a system of signs and codes okay, where organisms produce and interpret signs. And we also came across a wonderful word, I think, a uh, word like semiosphere, where like the atmosphere, we have a semiosphere or a space, if you will, which is, uh, you know, which is, which comprises sounds, smells, colors, waves, electric fields and motion. Fine. So, I welcome you once again, okay, to module 4 and I am sure it will be uh, you know very very interesting for you since we are dealing with media with culture industry um, and forms um, of culture including virtual forms right so we are going to look today at culture industry and the key source texts in this lecture are chris barker's cultural studies theory and practice chris barker's the ch dictionary of cultural studies and minakshi durham and douglas kellner's media and cultural studies Okay. Um, some of you are, I am sure, aware of where the term culture industry comes from, right? Those of you who uh, are aware of this term would, would definitely, you know, be acquainted with two scholars, uh, Theodore Adorno and Hochheimer, uh, right, and their famous work, uh, Dialectic of Enlightenment. The term culture industry. Okay, comes from uh, even if culture was understood perhaps even before them as industry, but the term was well in you know established by them in the discourse of culture in their essay the uh, the culture industry enlightenment as mass deception. So what we are going to do we are uh, you know this lecture is largely. Uh, largely based on, uh, on Adorno and Horkheimer's analysis of culture, though towards the end I will point to a, a critique of such a way of looking at culture. But the fact, you know, if you remember the uh, lecture on development, um, if you remember the lectures on globalization, we saw that culture may be considered an economic good, 
Okay. We saw how not simply metaphorically, culture is also an economic good being very much a part of the market. Right? So, here culture is seen as an industry and in this in the work by Adorno and Horkheimer, okay, uh, we shall see what, what uh, such an industry okay, uh, involving mass culture and mass consumption does to the consumer. You will recall that in module 3, we, uh, we already you know looked at consumption. I think there were two lectures uh, uh, you know devoted to consumption and here uh, in, in industry some of those points may also be recalled by us as we look at culture as industry. Fine. Now, Horkheimer and uh, Adorno have, have admitted uh, to the fact that the term culture industry okay, um, is analogous to terms like mass culture, okay, popular culture. They said that we uh, could have used the, the terms that were in currency like mass culture and popular culture, but to highlight you know the fact that culture works like an industry or the culture is an mass culture particularly is an industry, they use the term. Um, they use the term or they prefer the term culture industry. Okay? So, you may also apply the same thing as you discuss mass culture and popular culture. Right? Uh, now, they, their uh, work uh, particularly this work piece of work um, deals with cultural economies okay, with mass production and uh, a very important term here is that of mass deception. Okay, so, throughout uh, this lecture I hope to show you how consumers uh, of mass culture of mass um, um, of popular culture are sort of deceived that is the term are sort of deceived okay, by the culture industry. Okay. The first or the main focus um, of, cu of culture industry and the whole discourse of culture industries okay, is for us to understand right, that culture industries are after all in the service of capitalism. Okay. So, we if you, uh, you recall that we, we talked about Marxism in uh, module 1 I think when we are talking about theories I think two lectures were devoted to Marxism if I remember. And um, we find that capitalism is uh, an economic and political social arrangement, okay, where uh, the onus is on capital, where the onus is on private uh, profit, where the owner is on sur uh, onus, sorry, is on surplus, right? Um, we will not go into capitalism uh, in details here. In detail here. But the point being made by Adorno and Horkheimer okay, and other uh, you know, uh, people who are in this discourse of culture industry, uh, culture, uh, the culture industry is that like other industries, okay, the culture industry is also in the service of capitalism and it perpetuates the capitalist ethos. Okay, and that is it it um, shows in its various manifestations that uh, uh, you know the capitalist ethos or way of life and way of production distribution and consumption is um, you know the, the, the attempt is to show it as a naturalized one. Okay? So, it is not simply in our social arrangements and political arrangements, but also we may say in our cultural, okay, cultural arrangements that we find that even you know cultural forms like culture, you know, various forms of culture industries, for instance, media, for instance, uh, films, right. Um, these, uh, uh, you know, as Adorno and Horkheimer say, films, radio, television, okay, all these cultural forms, even, even art, okay, these try to, uh, to uh, you know, to see to it that the capitalist system. Uh, is well and alive that it is going strong. So, it is in the words uses are it is in the service the culture industry is in the service of the capitalist ethos or of capitalism. So, uh, when Adorno wrote uh, the essay culture industry reconsidered. Okay? So, he uh, revised some or you know some of the points that were made in the dialectic of enlightenment. Uh, 
um, he puts this beautifully. He says that is in a capitalist system, the customer is not king, right? As the culture industry would have us believe, not its subject but its object. Uh, let us look at this again. Okay? We may think that the, you know, in our process of consuming just like as we saw in the process of eating out for instance in the cultural practice of eating out. Okay, in, the, in similar way we find that we may feel that as a customer, as a consumer okay, of cultural goods, of media goods that we have choice. Um, you know, we are so to speak as it says uh, you know the, we are the kings and queens in this domain and are, we are being served by the culture industry, all the forms in the culture industry. But Adorno for makes this very important point and that it, this is that the cult you know it is actually uh, the, that the consumer has been made the object or you may also use the term target here, the, the consumer is the target. Uh, and not the king in you know they're not somebody who is being served according to his own good right or according to to his benefit hmm? uh, the point is that the 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 customer is not a subject in the sense that the customer is not an agent here it is the object or it is uh, the target of the cultural industries, right? So by now you know what you know I'm sure you have an idea of where the discussion is going to go fine we all, you know adorno and horkheimer belong to what we call the is what is known as the frankfurt school of critical theory and there was the you know uh, um, a very important uh, very powerful uh, a very powerful uh, impact okay of marxist theory here and uh, adorno and horkheimer are known um, as Marxists um, in, in, uh, in a sense which may not be you know a classical sort of Marxism which be a revisionist kind of Marxism, but we have to understand that these terms like reification, false consciousness, commodity fetish, fetishism, ideology and hegemony these Marxist terms are very well you know uh, are very well applicable or are very conducive to an understanding of culture industry as put forward by Adorno and Horkheimer. More of this in the next lecture when we devote uh, an entire lecture to the commodity as a cultural form. Fine. Now, the next important point that has been made by uh, you know or we can discuss on the culture industry and what it does to us is this okay, that there is a certain uniformity. right? There is a uh, instead of a healthy heterogeneity, okay, there is a certain uniformity, at least this is what is sought to be, or this is what is the aim okay, of a, a cultural industry, of cultural forms that are in the service of capitalism that tries to perpetuate capitalism and try that tries to show the ethos of capitalism as something that is a natural one, and that is in a way it is all that natural that it things should be you know in that order right so culture here okay uh, the word used here is infects okay you can see as on you know the uh, analogy to a disease right culture infects everything now let's look at this slide here culture infects according to adorno and horkheimer culture infects everything with sameness with standardization with regulation and finally, with deception. Now, what kind of culture are we talking about? We are talking here about, please remember this, this is important. We are talking here about mass culture, about popular culture, okay? uh, cultural forms that are consumed uh, by, by the masses, uh, which are you know, it's a, uh, forms that are popular, right? Of course, popular culture can be defined in more formal terms, but for our purpose here, it is important to know that culture industry as mass culture and popular culture uh, is something that uh, sort of infects us or injects into you know into our cultural uh, ambience okay, or environment a certain degree of sameness okay, of standardization and of regulation. This may be seen in terms of being deceived by the culture industry when you 
think as a consumer, as a customer that you or what you are consuming or what you are purchasing or you know what you are even intellectual goods, okay, what you are um, you know uh, the, uh, what you are partaking of right, even as intellectual goods are concerned, okay, you may think that there is a certain uniqueness to it right and uh, you think that this, this is something that will give you uh, or contribute to your identity formation. Okay. You take these things, these cultural forms and you and you are sort of you take even take pride in the fact that you have made certain choices, okay. But they uh, the critics in this school say quite the opposite. They say that you are we are being deceived. Why? Because underlying this is actually you know, you know um, a whole a reality of sameness of standardization and where our, our, our desires and our um, what should we say and our responses are already regulated okay, by a culture industry which is in the service of a capitalist system or a capitalistic ethos. Okay. Now, since I have already said that this is our chief text, we are now going to read a bit from Adorno and Horkheimer's essay, uh, The Culture Industry Enlightenment as Mass Deception. Okay. Let us begin. All mass culture under monopoly is identical. This is important. Okay. Mass, we have to, have to, uh, we have to sort of alert ourselves okay as as we um, consume culture okay mass culture that all forms of mass culture are really identical and the contours of its skeleton the conceptual armature fabricated by monopoly are beginning to stand out right so this is something uh, which adorno and horkheimer say uh, are something that will not be concealed okay for long why? Why is it beginning to stand out or show itself? This is because let us read on those in charge no longer let us underline this those in charge no longer take much trouble to conceal the structure. Okay. Look at this at least we one would have thought that in this whole process of deceiving at least where we are deceived there are attempts made by the capitalist system. And you know, a, a by a monopolistic system, uh, you know, there are attempts. At least we think that would be made to conceal the fact that we are being deceived, to conceal the fact that you know there is an uh, 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 there is uh, things have been made so rampantly identical, so enormously, hugely identical. Okay, so but they say that those who are in charge of the culture industries are even now now no longer okay trying to even hide the fact, even conceal the fact, fact or conceal the structure behind, uh, uh, behind their enterprises. Then they say the power of which increases the more bluntly its existence is admitted. Okay. So, there is a certain uh, you know a certain bluntness about things, there is no concealing okay, in this whole whole deceiving enterprise and enterprise of deceiving the people masses okay, um, in, in producing mass culture and producing ident you know forms cultural forms that, that are so identical, so repetitive infused with sameness uh, all these things are no longer even there is not even an attempt of the culture industry to hide its structures and there is a blunt okay, there is a blunt uh, so to say you know exhibition of their uh, of their forms. Then they uh, let us read on films and radio, films and radio no longer need to represent or present themselves as art, right. The truth that they are nothing but business, they are nothing but business is used as an ideology to legitimize okay, the trash, look at the word powerful word here really the trash they intentionally produce. So, this is almost you know uh, you can very well imagine or you can even draw the analogy to, um, uh, to commodity actual commodity production okay, uh, to assembly line production even right where mass goods are produced material goods are produced for consumption. So, also here okay, cultural goods and forms are produced in uh, what would be uh, a, a very direct and blunt 
bluntly identical manner uh, where things you know as they say here even things like films and radio which are you know which are considered to be art okay which are things that are uh, are you know to be thought out okay before they are presented to the public which has to be presented uh, in a certain degree of sophistication and complexity that we expect from good art. He says that they say that films and radio are also, they, it is no longer felt even that you present these cultural forms as art. Okay? Let me give you an example, I am sure a clear example, you will agree here, a clear example here are certain types of Bollywood movies certain types of Bollywood romances or well even probably certain types of crime thrillers uh, that are produced um, by the film industry in our country. Uh, look at also the soaps, you know for instance um, there are some you know so many soaps which are so identical both in presentation and in theme and content. Okay? So, uh, you know we, we I am sure some of us have you know even wondered uh, you know how you know we do not even know which sort of soap we are in okay they are so similar the situations are similar the dialogues are similar right and some of us are all us also perhaps have wondered uh, how how these kind or different these soaps that are so identical that fil these films movies that are so identical are being produced uh, continually okay so there is a certain if I may use the word uh, a thoughtlessness behind it, why and the reason that Adorno and Horkheimer identify is this. Okay? The reason is that, that this is business right, uh, and not art and you do not even have to make an attempt to hide the fact that here supposedly art you know art forms that are supposedly to do with art are being turned into business. Now, when they are turned into business for mass consumption there is bound to be a certain homogeneity about these things. Okay? They are bound to be you know things that are identical. So, the truth that they are nothing but business is used as an ideology is used as a world view okay, to legitimize the trash that they are intentionally producing. Right? So, they do not have they are not answerable that is a, uh, you know we may we may explain it in that sense they are not answerable to the public to the very public that consumes these things okay then we shall read on again the standardized forms it is claimed were originally derived from the needs of the consumers. Okay? So, the first at first it was claimed that well consumers need these things, consumers needs, uh, need uh, certain uh, you know themes, uh, consumers need for uh, you know certain, um, uh, certain, certain ways of presenting okay, content. Okay? So, these standardized forms it is claimed were originally derived from the needs of the consumers that is why they are accepted with so little resistance. Okay? Now, again let us look at you know what we call uh, the, the famous Sas Bahu serials for instance. Right? So, there is an the, the initial uh, argument to be made by the culture industry by the proponents of the culture industry this kind of industry is that uh, these are needed consumers want these and that is why we are presenting it no matter how identical these are, okay? as long as they need it, we are going to produce these things even if they are identical. So, the standardized forms are you know the, the whole argument behind it is that they are derived from the needs of the consumers, that is why they are accepted with so little resistance. But Adorno and Horkheimer point out what actually is happening is that in see look at this in reality a cycle they call it a cycle of manipulation and retroactive need is unifying the system okay where where they show that you know that um, actually people want these products people want them in a certain format uh, in a certain language if you will right uh, they want it over and over again the reality as has been um, as has been pointed out by 
Adorno and Horkheimer is that this is really manipulation of the very audience that it purports to serve, right. So, in reality a cycle of manipulation and retroactive need is unifying the system ever more tightly. What is not mentioned is that the basis on which technology is gaining power over society is the power of those whose economic position in society is the strong, strongest, okay. So, in a way it is like saying you know the in the um, you know, in the in the common parlance that we say uh, that they, they, they are the ones who are laughing their way to the bank. Okay? So, those whose you know as long uh, uh, as far as this technology is gaining power, okay, this technology also belongs to the ones who have an uh, who, who whose economic position in society is strong, strongest. Again relate this to you know Marxism, relate this to the classical um, you know um, version of if I may use the word Marxism that we had discussed in, um, in the first module, right. So, what are the terms that we have after having been uh, you know through the words of Adorno and Horkheimer in their essay is that you know ideologies are therefore predetermined. You may think that you have a certain ideology and remember what is an ideology? Let us go back again to our lectures. Ideologies are ways of looking at the world, they are lenses of looking at the world, okay. Uh, you know they, they uh, you know an ideology is a world view that you hold and your actions are also going to be uh, it is we believe motivated by the ideology that you hold. And we believe wrongly erroneously okay this kind of analysis would tell us we believe erroneously that our ideologies our world views are are ours, are uniquely ours, are singularly ours, but that is not the fact. The fact is the culture industry predetermines the ideologies that you are going to hold okay? and therefore, uh, logically it also predetermines the actions that you are going to perform, the decisions that you are going to make as far as your life, your living, your cultural practices are concerned. Okay? So, the, we need to take heed even as we consume, even as we enjoy, even if as we find these mass culture goods okay, and forms, even if we find them pleasurable, we have to uh, also go behind the scenes as it were and understand and grasp this very important political, uh, political aspect okay, that ideologies are predetermined by um, you know the culture industry as far as the mass culture goes. Okay. So, we also then see it let us look at this slide please, we see it in terms of a manipulation, we see it you know as if we are being manipulated right, our ideologies are manipulated, our world views are manipulated, our aesthetics are manipulated and eventually perhaps our relationships with one another, our social relationships, our personal relationships, our professional relationships are also being manipulated and decided sort of pre-decided okay, by somebody else. This means that there is of course, social control, there is a great degree of social control by the mass media and its forms. Okay. Finally, therefore, the world that is presented before us by the mass media by the culture industries, forms of cult the culture industries is an illusory world. Okay. The more we partake of these forms and products, the more we live in a world of illusion. The uh, you know it, this is really a kind of commodity fetish fetishism, right? Which we will discuss in the next lecture when we talk about uh, the commodity. Okay. Uh, but the fact is the mass media is very powerful in this and in the sense it can also create a world of illusion. Why? Why is the world of illusion? How is it created? By constant repetition, okay? by constant uh, repetition, by, by sameness, by producing identical things okay? almost in an assembly line fashion where you you know by using these things repeatedly in their sameness and in their you know identicalness if I may use the word. Okay. We are being deceived, we are being manipulated and we are being illusioned. Such is you know the so, so strong is the argument that is pre provided by, by you know the proponents of uh, the term the culture industry particularly as given to us by Adorno and Horkheimer. Right. So, what happens in this case? Just a while ago we saw um, 
that you know ideologies are predetermined, we are being manipulated, we live you know increasingly in an illusionary world and there is tremendous social control by cultural industries over us. What does this ultimately lead to? This leads to the maintenance of social hierarchies. Okay? So, if there is no critique, if uh, there is no resistance, remember the point being made by Adorno and Horkheimer, there is very little resistance okay? um, uh, because consumers are made to think that this is what you want and we are, we are being sort of loyal and faithful to you, we are good giving you what you want cultural forms are things that you want. When there is very little resistance and when there is you know the consuming of cultural forms be it movies, televisions, television serials or uh, you know any other cultural form, uh, there is the, the social hierarchy under a capitalist system which is an exploitative one is maintained, it is perpetuated right. So, remember one of the initial slides that we saw what was the point made that the culture industries are largely in the service of capitalism in the maintenance and perpetuation of a capitalist hierarchical exploitative ethos right. So, first point we get is there is a maintenance of social hierarchy, second is there is a consent to the order right. The more you consume these goods, these cultural forms okay, uh, there is a consent and then how, which term are we going to use from Marxism? We are going to use the term hegemony if you remember. Okay? Uh, there is a hegemony uh, which we, we which is translated by many as manufactured consent. Okay? This consent is something that we give with perhaps increasingly very little resistance in some people very little resistance to the goods that are being uh, doled out to us by the culture industry. So, there is a consent to the order, which order there is a consent to not simply the cultural order and the cultural forms, there is a consent, uh, there is a consent to uh, eventually it means that there is a consent to the socio-political order which is uh, the capitalist order. Okay. So, without knowing okay, through the consumption through you would say an unproblematized uh, uh, consumption of uh, the, cul you know, the forms of the cul of culture industries okay, through these uh, you know the uh, the or the capitalist order is being maintained and retained. Okay. Finally, there is an acceptance from a purely cultural studies perspectives, how would we articulate it? We would say that there is an acceptance of the signs, the signifying practices, the codes that are being given to us you know by, um, by the culture industries. Okay? Culture industries and their forms are also signifying practices, why? Because they encode, they encode reality for us in certain ways and particularly through this very powerful tool known as uh, called sameness. Uh, powerful tool of ident uh, things being identical. Okay, what happens is, uh, you know, the codes, the fact that co signs and codes are uh, there's an encoding, and we decode them according to the way, you know, uh, the system wants us to decode them. We f these become sort of naturalized, right? And we forget that these were in fact social and cultural constructions in the first place. These are not innocuous constructions. These are constructions that add to a system according to Adorno and Horkheimer, ha Horkheimer a system that is exploited uh, fundamentally exploitative in nature. Okay. Then we we'll read further okay, and we we'll look at the term entertainment as has been understood by Adorno and Horkheimer in their essay the culture industry. Okay. So, they have they, they, they shed a very different light on the way we understand entertainment. Okay. Entertainment, uh, we, we go for movies for instance, we watch television or we have various forms of entertainment. Okay. They uh, very radically forward this point that entertainment is the prolongation of work under late capitalism. Okay. Common sense tells us, okay, commonsensical views of entertainment tell us that entertainment is escape from work. Okay, after a hard day's work, you go home or a hard days, uh, you know, day full of classes and lab work. You you go to your, your hostel and you watch your movie and in order to, in, you know, uh, or you engage in, uh, you know, in forms of entertainment. Uh, 
uh, media, you're talking about mass culture entertainment here, and you would think that, well, I, I, this is, I'm moving away from work. But Adorno and Horkheimer say that entertainment is a prolongation of work under late capitalism. Let's see how. Entertainment is sought by those who want to escape the mechanized labor process. Okay, let's read this again. It is sought by those who want to escape the mechanized labor process so that they can cope with it again. Okay, so you know, I mm, I want want to to uh, peruse these uh, or I want to want to use these you know um, cultural forms because all this while I've been engaged in a very mechanized sort of a labor, very repetitive. Okay, so that uh, I I can be refreshed, so to speak. Okay, and I can come back to my so-called mechanized labor, mechanized work. But Adorno and Horkheimer say no. Okay? They say that we should not forget that at the same time, however, mechanization has such power over leisure and its happiness determined so thoroughly the fabrication of entertainment commodities that the off-duty worker can experience nothing but after images of the work process itself. Let us read this again. At the same time, okay, mechanization in the labor process for instance has such power over leisure and the happiness that it, it, it produces and mechanization in the mass culture or the culture industry determines you know what they call the fabric of entertainment commodities. Technology we call technological domination okay, or technological rationality or even an instrumental rationality you know through technology okay, creates a fabric or creates the whole tenor or the whole content theme presentation of, uh, of, of what they call entertainment commodities that you know what they call the off duty worker that is the worker who is in search of entertainment as a distraction is actually really part uh, you know uh, continuing the labor process, the mechanized labor process, which they call the after images of the work process itself. Okay? So, we this is very different from as I said again, very different from the commonsensical way of understanding um, entertainment. Entertainment and the mechanized labor process under capitalism of a technological ra rationality are not different. They are uh, you know both are produced by the same logic of technological uh, of domination. Okay? This is something that is immensely important as we read Adorno and Horkheimer. Then they, they, they uh, continue this point um, and I am reading their words, the only escape from the work process in factory and office is through adaptation to it in leisure time. Okay? So, you are only adapting to it and your leisure time is nothing but the prolongation or an extension of your work process. This is the, they call it and they use very strong words, These, this is the incurable sickness of all entertainment, okay, where entertainment should have refreshed us, where entertainment should have you know given us food for thought, should have uh, you know distracted us in a, in a, in a very healthy, uh, healthy sense, okay, should have taken us away from mechanized labor processes. They say that entertainment itself become sort of sickly. Okay, and they call it an incurable sickness, sickly with the very logic of technological uh, domination. Amusement, let's read on, amusement congeals into boredom, since to be, to be amusement it must cost no effort and therefore moves strictly along the well worn grooves of association. This is again you have to associate this or you have to relate this to terms like sameness and identity, replicability, everything is uh, following the same logic. The spectator must need no thoughts of his own. Okay? So, there is really uh, you uh, where entertain, as I said, where entertainment should have given you food for thought, should have given you healthy distraction, uh, you sort of become uh, consumers who do not need to do any work. Okay, why? After all, it, because it is a prolongation of your own work process. Okay? So, you sit back and it is again repeated that mechanized labor and that domination, the, the logic of technological domination uh, is 
in its entire in this in this thorough boredom okay where amusement should have, true amusement should have uh, been in its thorough boredom demands no really no uh, uh, no uh, mental work from you in the sense that it demands no thinking, no create at least demands no creative thinking on your part. Okay, so let's read on. The spectator must need no thoughts of its uh, of his own. The product prescribes. Look at this beautiful word here. Prescribes each reaction. That is the reaction that even the reaction that you're going to have. Okay, to towards the cultural form towards. Uh, you know these entertainment forms is also something that is prescribed. So you will you will react to it, you'll respond to it, okay, according to the way. So even the responses are being determined beforehand. So the spectator must need no thoughts of his own. The product prescribes each relation, oh sorry, reaction, not through any actual adherence, but through signals. Okay, so you. Um, uh, the product prescribes the reaction through its signs and codes. Any logical connection presupposing mental capacity is scrupulously avoided. We, we very, of course, very strong. We note the very strong sarcasm in uh, in the words of uh, you know um, Adorno and Horkheimer. Then the example is given here from cartoons and stunt films. Okay, and, and a lot of work is also uh, you know currently going on 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 the representation process in cartoons in even uh, you know in in stunt films for instance and we uh, there is a very very interesting point being made here is that is initially if you looked at cartoon films you know what was uh, what was the motive the motive was that there the cartoon films the cartoon films provide you flights of fantasy Okay, from rationalism, there is, uh, you know, uh, pure rationality is something that we cannot live with definitely all the time. Okay, we cannot live uh, as purely sort of uh, logical beings, symbol manipulating beings uh, all the time. We are beings that emote. We have our emotional lives, our desires. Okay, uh, you know, our our feelings, our sentiments. Uh, so, cartoon films were initially, you know, we 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 enjoyed them as flights from fantasy. Right, uh, fly, uh, uh, flights of fantasy. Sorry, flights of fantasy from uh, uh, almost a repressive rationality. But what is happening today? And let's look at the slides. We see, initially, where there were flights of fantasy from rationalism, uh, today there is a restraining of individual resistance. Okay, so so that even these cartoon films, uh, the stunt films, are Im immensely predictable. Right? They are no longer, they are still within, this is the point they make, they are still within uh, uh, the structure, okay? they are still within the structure of rationalism, of technological rationalism. Um, so, that you know, uh, even when I watch cartoon films, increasingly I find uh, them to be boring. Why? Because they do not, they are simply, the, the, the technology is the same, the repetition is the same, uh, the, the, the voiceovers are the same. I am not talking about very very excellent uh, animation films, but I would say that even these anim excellent animation films perhaps run the risk of such sameness and uh, you know identicalness. Right? So, where there should have been flights, uh, healthy flights of fantasy, today we find that there is no resistance. Okay? There is no uh, resistance to the technological order um, being given by this cartoon films or this stunt films. Okay? They again become a prolongation or extension of the very mechanized labor we are all trying to escape from. So, therefore, there is a cultural dumbing down, okay? the cultural dumbing down as one critic has put it, there is a colonization of leisure by the culture industry. Right? Uh, however, I would like to end with this point before we move on to the discussion. Uh, there are. It's not that there are no critiques of this discourse of culture, of this discourse of cultural forms, media forms, mass culture forms, and they uh, these uh, you know the uh, these advocates of the other way of looking at culture industry also say that well, uh, it is not that resistance doesn't happen. Okay, um, the it is not that everyone capitulates to the capitalist order, it is not that there is no resistance and there is not that there is no you know um, attempt made by filmmakers, by media 
people who produce media forms to sensitize people to this very uh, no, rationale of technological domination. They also say that, uh, that we have to admit instead of putting everything within this theoretical framework, we also have to admit that there is a great deal of diversity. Uh, you know, uh, th there is a great deal of diversity, diverse themes, diverse techniques that are which are being being produced, and as we uh, have, as we get the op various opportunities to to uh, have dialogues with other cultures to look at their cultural forms, there is a diversity which resists. Okay, this process of mechanized labor and the extension of lab labor. Right. So um, we end on this note. Uh, on this positive note of uh, uh, you know where it is we understand we begin to say that it is possible for us uh, not to be just passive consumers and to have our reactions and choices prescribed by the culture industry. So, let us go to the discussion and just one or two questions. What are the chief arguments of the culture industry discourse? The chief argument is that one that culture industries are eventually okay, um, in the service of a capitalist ethos and all the forms being produced by the, the culture industries uh, you know, only perpetuate a capitalist ethos and try and attempt to show these things as natural. And they also secondly that culture infects everything with sameness, okay, with standardi standardization regulation which eventually deceive the um, deceive those who consume its products. Okay. Remember this is in the case of mass culture, okay. mass culture produce same the same goods identical goods okay. and there is standardization even in an assembly line sort of way and there is a regulation of both our, our choices and our responses through signals through signs and codes which ultimately end up to be uh, a deception of the consumer. Okay. So, we therefore, eventually have predetermined ideologies and social control illusion etcetera. There is a cultural dumbing down and a colonization of. The last question, how may leisure and entertainment be conceptualized within this argument given by O'Donnell and Horkheimer and others of the school is that entertainment is seen as a prolongation of work okay, where uh, because of uh, its um, because of the logic of technological domination and the off duty worker experiences really nothing but after images of the work process itself and even in, in uh, you know uh, supposedly uh, powerful medium media like cartoon films and stunt films okay, which are which we saw as resistance okay, to such a domination are no longer flights of fantasy, but and there is no longer any resistance. Okay. They are not channels of resistance and to be entertainment means therefore, to be in agreement and entertainment makes itself possible only by insulating itself in the words of Adorno and Horkheimer from the totality of the social process. Okay. And amusement always means putting things out of mind, forgetting suffering even when it is on display. So, uh, I hope we, we after this we have some food for thought really and um, to, to uh, you know to, to see how within cultural studies, cultural forms and uh, you know, which are called to be products of, we are just said to be sorry, products of the culture industry uh, may be looked at from a critical angle, okay. maybe, maybe uh, even as we make our choices, these have very powerful lessons for us, not only academically, but also as we lead our lives and we make our choices in entertainment, perhaps it would, it is, um, you know, perhaps it is desirable that we understand where we are being manipulated, where our choices and also our responses are being prescribed by predetermined pre ideologies. Um, and we uh, will stop here and um, uh, the next lecture, second lecture in the module 4 will be devoted solely to the commodity, okay, because that is the starting point really. And that is, uh, if you, those of you who are acquainted with uh, Das Kapital, where Karl Marx's Das Kapital, will also remember that it is with uh, this, this uh, most elementary unit, the commodity, okay, um, with which Marx begins his critique and description of capitalism. Thank you for now.